By 1606, Bartholomew Gosnold and Gabriel Archer had spent four years touring the taverns and company halls of London, describing the wonders of the goodliest continent we ever saw. They'd visited in 1602 on a mission funded by the Earl of Southampton. They'd named Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyards, and now Archer had written a description of the continent which helped people to truly imagine its exotic wonders. Gosnold and Archer were serious, and London's colonial elite had a new mission to rally around. At Richard Hacklett's suggestion, the Earl of Southampton sent a man named George Weymouth on a quick tour to verify their claims, and when Weymouth came back similarly enthusiastic, a group of high-profile elites submitted an official petition for a North American land grant. That list included Hacklett, Wingfield, Summers, Gates, George Popham, and others, and was written by Edward Cook. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. This was a big deal for England for a number of reasons. First, if England didn't act on this colonization effort, its claim to North America would effectively expire. The Spanish already didn't recognize England's title, but the Law of Nations effectively gave the English the title to North America because of the possibility of Raleigh's Roanoke settlers having survived. Continual habitation was a huge part of possession, and if even one of the Roanoke settlers survived, England had that. If, however, England refused to act further, the Spanish could easily argue that the English right had expired because they weren't acting on it, and England would forever lose the ability to set up colonies in North America. Second, James was near bankruptcy, and he and his privy council were continually trying to find new sources of revenue. Parliament was both stingy with money and used James's financial situation to negotiate for their own reforms, and James had the right to levy customs duties, so colonies could technically help his financial situation. Clearly, going forward with the Virginia colony was a good idea, but they also had to decide what form the colony should take. The days of Raleigh-style private monopolies were over. Some people wanted to make colonization a fully public effort, fully controlled by Parliament and paid for by taxes. On the other hand, a public colonization venture was a statement that England was staking its claim to the New World, and that might provoke a war with Spain. It also opened the government up to criticism if the colony failed. The middle ground solution was proposed by Walter Cope and John Popham. The Virginia Company would be a private organization which would answer to the crown. It would be autonomous, but James would have the final say in its affairs, and in terms of paperwork, there would be a minimal connection between the two. This minimized diplomatic and political risk for the government, and they could keep the venture as discreet as possible. And even when the Spanish discovered that the English were setting up colonies in North America, James could feign ignorance. The most difficult thing for a company like this would be raising money, because at this point, North America had a reputation as a terrible investment. A huge amount of money had been lost in Atlantic exploration since the 1570s, and the only real profitable activity had been privateering, which James had forbidden. Whatever form the Virginia Company took, though, one man could be counted on to get involved, and that man was Robert Cecil, the Earl of Salisbury, and James's right-hand man. Cecil had transitioned from being Elizabeth's closest advisor to being James's closest advisor, and even beyond that role, he was prepared to intervene in anything that happened in England. He had spies and agents everywhere, including at a dinner party that Bartholomew Gosnold attended in Southampton. And he used that spy to have Gosnold's name removed from company paperwork. To give you an idea of Cecil's character and reputation, he was the first person in English history to have ever been described as Machiavellian. 
Some people even believe that he'd orchestrated the gunpowder plot, which he then thwarted, as a way to eliminate his political enemies. And, in fact, the plot had involved a lot of the same people as the Essex Rebellion, which was, in large part, an attempt to eliminate Cecil's influence. Whether or not Cecil had actually orchestrated the gunpowder plot, it's again a good illustration of his power, influence, tactics, and reputation in England. And it's worth noting that Cecil did, in fact, use the investigation after the plot to round up multiple of his political enemies. It's also interesting to note that the person who drafted the Virginia Charter was possibly Edward Cook, close Cecil associate who had prosecuted Essex, Sir Walter Raleigh, and the gunpowder plot participants. In short, Cecil was one of the most powerful men in the kingdom, but it's also hard to figure out his exact motivations. One thing we do know is that after Cecil's death, James found out that Cecil had been on the Spanish payroll. His motivations weren't that simple, though. He had his own goals and games going on, and he was good at them. It's just very hard to know exactly what he was up to. Regardless, when the 1606 Virginia colonization attempt emerged, Cecil was ready and able to intervene. On April 6, 1606, the charter was granted, creating the Virginia Company and with it a possession which would be the subject of power struggles and political intrigue for the next 20 years. The charter actually provided for the establishment of two North American colonies. The southern one, or first colony, went from modern Cape Fear to the Hudson, and was given to a group of gentlemen, investors, and explorers like Gates, Summers, Hacklett, and Wingfield. They formed the Virginia Company. The northern colony was given to a group of merchants from the West Country, including Hannam, Gilbert, and Popham, and went from the Potomac to the modern Canadian border. It was run by the Plymouth Company, and no, that's not a coincidence. There was overlap between the two colonies' territories with the idea that the future boundary would develop somewhere within the overlap. To prevent conflict, neither company could set up a town within a hundred miles of one of the other company's towns. Within a couple months, both companies started working on their colonization ventures. Richard Hacklett wrote the orders for the colonization of Virginia, and they were mostly similar to the ones that he'd written for the East India Company. It's in these orders that we can first see Cecil's influence start to appear. Hacklett in addition to being one of England's biggest advocates of colonization, was a patron of Robert Cecil, and he'd actually been the person to suggest that that Southampton-funded confirmation mission that Weymouth took. So while most colonies at the time had a governor appointed by investors, instead, the Virginia Company would be supervised by a 13-person royal council which reported directly to Cecil. Within a month, people were complaining that the Royal Council's interference was making it harder to get investors. Cecil insisted on the utmost secrecy, claiming that that was to prevent alerting the Spanish of the mission, but obviously that wasn't true. It was also the Royal Council that hired Newport over the heads of the Virginia Company's leadership. About a month before the first ship set sail, the Virginia Company held a meeting to decide the membership of the Leadership Council in Virginia. Obviously, they put two Cecil agents, Kendall and Ratcliffe, on the council. And Cecil had the records from that meeting seized, and they haven't been seen since. That means that we have no idea of exactly how Cecil engineered for the two to end up on the council. By December, though, the colonists had left London, hoping that by leaving in winter, they'd arrive in Virginia in time to plant crops, which could feed the settlement the following winter. Before they even reached the Chesapeake, the Spanish knew about the mission. In fact, the Spanish ambassador knew exactly what was in the Virginia Charter and who was on the Royal Council. That list was essentially unknown outside of James's Privy Council, and that means that it was Cecil who told them. So much for secrecy. 
Soon, the Spanish captured a ship which was scouting out settlement locations for the Plymouth Company, and it took the sailors back to Spain for interrogation. And Cecil advised James to leave them to their fate in Spain. Meanwhile, he prepared to send his own secret delegation to Madrid. That delegation included George Waynemouth, the captain that Hacklett had suggested should go to North America to verify Gosnold and Archer's claims. And it was because of that mission that Waynemouth knew the coast of North America as well as anyone in England. He could easily guide the Spanish to the colony so that they could efficiently destroy it. Cecil truly did have spies and agents everywhere, and at this point in time, it looks like he was sending people to Spain who could lead the Spanish to the colony so they could wipe it out. The question arises of why, and the answer is, we don't know. Fortunately for the colonists, right before Waynemouth left for Spain, Newport returned to England. That put the plan on hold as Cecil and the Spanish reevaluated the situation. The sample of ore that Newport had brought back was worthless, which prompted virtually all of the backers to abandon the venture, even Newport himself. It was only the treasurer, Sir Thomas Smythe, who managed to pull the company back together, and he had to use every shred of influence he had to do it. As treasurer, Smythe was the London-based leader of the company, and he was a founding member of the company. He had been brought in by Gosnold and Archer to organize the venture, and help them do the paperwork. He was also the founder of the East India Company. So Smythe convinced Newport and the others that maybe Newport had just brought back the wrong sample of ore. And Smythe highlighted the progress that Percy discussed in a secret letter to his brother, the Earl of Northumberland. Things looked promising, and the colonists had had at least built a fort. So the investors agreed to fund another mission. Meanwhile, in Spain, King Philip's advisors were recommending that he use all necessary force to stop the venture. But Philip himself was reluctant. He had taken the throne just five years before James, and he'd inherited a massive, though fragmented, empire, which was dealing with economic decline and a plague outbreak, as well as Dutch revolts in the Low Countries. He also inherited the same volatile political situation which had characterized Europe since the Reformation, and which would, in just over a decade, pull Spain into the Thirty Years' War. Philip himself wasn't a particularly effective ruler, and he was known for being just middle of the road enough to avoid being hated. So for Philip, the question was whether destroying the colony was worth ending the newfound peace with England. It looked like the colony might collapse on its own without endangering the peace, and that would be ideal. If it wasn't going to be a big threat to Spanish interests anyway, inaction was best. If, on the other hand, the purpose were to provide English pirates with a new world base as had been the case in Roanoke, it would be worth risking war to eliminate it. Waiting and seeing was a better option than unnecessarily ending the peace, so Philip ordered his ambassador to England, Don Pedro de Thuniga, to keep him updated. Thuniga had spies and connections who kept him well informed of developments, but he also asked for a meeting with James, where he pushed hard for the king to stop colonization efforts in Virginia. Thuniga said that it was against good friendship and brotherliness for the English to go to Virginia, which was a part of the Indies, which belonged to Spain. And James responded that he didn't know too much about what was going on in Virginia, but he also didn't know that Spain had a right to it, since it was so far from where they had settled. The private nature of the venture certainly helped James's defense. Thuniga then hinted that Spain would risk war to wipe out the colony, and James responded that he wouldn't risk war to defend it. At a later meeting, Cecil backed up what James had said. If something bad happened to the settlers, it would be their own fault. It was a smart deflection on James's part. The fact that Virginia wasn't all that important to England meant that it might not be a a long-term issue, and that it was safe for Philip to wait and see. In fall of 1607, 
the first supply mission left England, and it was a hurried and desperately underfunded mission. Smythe had to resort to sending moth-eaten supplies that were left over from a previous East India Company voyage. When Newport returned, not only was there no gold-bearing earth, Wingfield had also returned. He gave the London Company its first dose of North American faction fighting. A few weeks later, Francis Nelson also failed to bring back anything valuable, just some cedar and iron ore that the company sold for four pounds a ton to the East India Company. Investors had threatened to bail on Virginia after just one voyage failed to produce returns, and now two had. The colonists had been in Virginia for a year, and they had nothing to show for it. Smythe was having a harder and harder time keeping the company afloat, so he issued accusations and an ultimatum to the colonists. It's your fault, and if you don't send us back something of value, we'll stop supporting you. It was worded as a threat, but the latter part was true. Smythe was the one person who was keeping the company together, and he couldn't do it forever. The silver lining was that the colonists had discovered that Virginia could grow tobacco. The valuable commodity had been popularized by Sir Walter Raleigh, but it had been virtually impossible to obtain in England since 1606, when Spain had banned tobacco cultivation in in South America. Just a few months before the Virginia colonists had set sail, John Eldred and John Watts had tried and failed to set up a tobacco colony in the Caribbean, and a few months later, a second mission supported by Raleigh failed even more disastrously. The Spanish had captured the ships, demanded a 5,000 pound ransom to return the crew and the settlers, and then, after receiving the money, hanged the prisoners anyway. England needed a new source of tobacco, but Virginia's native tobacco was too harsh to be worth much. Still, there was some hope. In 1609, Philip's council was still pushing him to destroy the colony, as was Thuniga. Thuniga was watching more and more ships full of worthless goods return from Virginia, and he kept hearing about how much the colony needed money. Yet, the colony continued to send people, mostly young men. He started to believe that the only explanation was that the colony was being set up as a piracy base meant to provoke sectarian war. Philip still didn't want to stage a dramatic attack, but a rogue Englishman named William Stanley finally convinced him to act. He agreed to send a ship from St. Augustine to the Chesapeake to see what was going on. And this was the ship that had turned around after seeing Argall's ship in the Chesapeake Bay. A few weeks after that incident, Newport returned to England with Ratcliffe and Archer and, yet again, nothing of value. By this time, even Smythe's closest associates, including Alderman Robert Johnson, were preparing to abandon Virginia. Popham had been the highest ranking person who still supported Smythe's efforts, and he died at this time. The Virginia venture was on the verge of collapse, but unbeknownst to the company, John Smith had sent back the document which would save it. Of course, he sent back his letter condemning the company and demanding a list of changes from London, but he'd also sent back a detailed account of the wonders of Virginia and its local people. The company would never have published it because it didn't portray management in a flattering light, but one night, Smith's document ended up on a table in the Mermaid Tavern. The Mermaid Tavern was the home of a secretive London literary drinking club called the Cyrenicals. Shakespeare may have been a member. In fact, I tend to think he was. John Martin's father certainly was. Raleigh was, as was future colonist William Strachey and members of Henry Spellman's family. Multiple members of James's parliamentary opposition, known as the Rebel MPs, were also members, and another member was a Catholic named John Healy, who had been arrested during the gunpowder plot investigation, and who had then informed on the activities of a man named John Sycamore, a Catholic priest who was supposedly plotting to assassinate Cecil. The de facto leader of the group was Thomas Thorpe, a friend of John Smith 
who also had connections to Catholic exiles in Spain. Those details aren't particularly important to the narrative, but they give some perspective on the club and its relation to Virginia. What is important is that Smith gave Thorpe a copy of his true relation, and Thorpe ordered Healy to edit out the most inflammatory parts and publish it. The book was an instant success. It captured people's imaginations, and soon people were obsessed enough to buy just about anything Virginia-related. And books on Virginia were in such high demand that publishers were trying to get their hands on anything that included Virginia in the title. And they were even repurposing older works to highlight their Virginia connection. So a French book about Canadian exploration, for instance, was translated with the title Nova Francia, or the description of that part of New France, which is one continent with Virginia. A Portuguese work became Virginia richly valued by the description of mainland Florida, her next neighbor. The colony was no longer this secret Cecil dominated scheme. It was something that had captured the public imagination. And one of the most important people whose imagination Virginia caught at this time was James's 13 year old heir, Prince Henry. Henry himself had captured the public imagination, and along with Charles II, was probably the only member of the Stuart family that the English ever really liked. When he was a kid, Henry was the kind of young heir who had been rare in England for centuries, and as he grew up, he adopted all the Protestant virtues that his father seemed to lack, and he became so popular that he set up his own court opposite from his father's in every way. It was idealistic, bold, austere, virtuous, and drawn to the Elizabethan ideals of heroism and adventure. Henry even befriended Sir Walter Raleigh. So Henry started to get involved, and he and the Cyrenicals started to really rival Cecil's influence. Henry commissioned Robert Tyndall to bring him back maps and reports from Virginia, and he asked Raleigh to write papers on North America. Raleigh even hoped to lead an expedition there. Henry's chaplain gave a sermon talking about how Henry VIII had ignored Columbus's pleas for support to explore the West and how England was still behind Spain because of that decision. Other preachers started to echo these sentiments and soon rhetoric about colonization built to an all-time high. Both religious and secular figures were talking about how Virginia would drive the greatness that England was destined for, and they said that supporting the mission was a religious and civic duty. In 1609, James was on the verge of bankruptcy, and Cecil was being forced to make concessions to Parliament in exchange for further funding. One of the concessions that Parliament asked for was giving the Virginia Company more control over Virginia, a new charter with expanded privileges. They had Henry's support, and Virginia was a popular subject, Smythe was a member of Parliament, and many of the Cyrenicals were also rebel MPs. It was a concession that Cecil was willing to make, and Smythe started to draft the new charter with a man named Edwin Sands. Sands was the leader of the rebel MPs who were fighting James in Parliament. He was a dedicated Protestant, even working with John Pym on anti-Catholic legislation, and he wanted to see Protestant colonization efforts rival Catholic ones. More than a colonial figure, though, Sands was a deeply political figure in England, and his politics were immediately visible in the new charter. Most importantly, there was thorough democratization. Anyone at all who gave 50 pounds was appointed to the Royal Council, and that made being an investor in the Virginia Company a great networking opportunity. There were regular meetings of the Royal Council, so anyone who gave 50 pounds got regular access to some of the most powerful men in James's court. The size of the council quadrupled, and many of the new members were Cyrenicals and rebel MPs. At this point, some of the earliest investors were upset by the politicization of the company and withdrew their money, but some of the rich Puritan-leading companies like cloth workers and merchant tailors started giving hundreds of pounds. Cecil's influence was being replaced by that of a very different group of people. 
The second charter also clearly incorporated some of John Smith's recommendations, including with regard to Indian relations. Finally, Smythe also influenced a lot of the second charter's changes. The faction fighting and failure of Virginia to produce adequate profits had put him in embarrassing situations more than once, so he pushed for consolidation of power in the colony. Now there would be one governor with full and absolute authority to publish, pardon, govern, and rule, and even impose martial law when necessary. There may be democracy in England, but there would be no more disarray in Virginia. Rejuvenated, the company was raising money for a huge new mission, the first under the second charter, to be launched within weeks. They worried that it might not get there in time to prevent the settlement's collapse into anarchy or famine, but they were really going all out this time. The company was recruiting everybody who was willing to go, and even the Lord Mayor of London was pushing people to help the company. He encouraged parishes to pay to send their undesirables to Virginia, and that was an attractive offer. 30 youths were sent, as well as a handful of vagrants and petty criminals, and 30 unwed women who could become settlers' wives. Artisans were attracted with the offer that for eight months' wages, they could get a house, vegetable gardens, orchard, food, and clothing, all at the company's expense, as well as keeping a share of all the products and profits that resulted from their labor. That was also an amazing offer. Obviously, we know that John Rolfe was one of the people who signed up to go this mission, and it was almost certainly John Watts who gave him a sample of Trinidad tobacco seed from his and Eldred's attempted settlement. And that tobacco would be what ultimately took hold in Virginia. The company selected Thomas Gates to lead the mission, and it instructed him to find a new settlement location close to what's now Richmond, to act as the capital, and to find the Roanoke survivors. They also gave him a set of secret boxes with if-then instructions in case Gates died so that the assembled council could install a new governor without more faction fighting. By May, the ships were preparing to leave, and even Prince Henry visited the docks to mark the momentous occasion. Suddenly, though, Cecil issued an emergency order recalling Gates to London, and then he kept Gates there for multiple days while the rest of the colony just sat on their ships in the docks. They were going through food stores, which could be potentially catastrophic, and if they were delayed too long, they ran the risk of arriving in Virginia too late to plant crops. Side note, it was in this lull that Ratcliffe made out the will which identified him as John Sycamore. Cecil's delays, though, risked the entire future of the mission, and Summers wasn't going to risk the entire future of the mission for Gates. Cecil was by now openly hostile to Virginia, correctly thinking that Henry was going to use it to revive Elizabethan imperial plans. Cecil was trying to cripple the mission without provoking a direct confrontation with the prince, and Summers wasn't going to let him get away with it. When Summers gave the order for the ships to leave with or without Gates, Cecil quickly demoted Gates to lieutenant governor, replaced him with Lord Delaware, and sent him back to the docks. The ship set sail and everything looked great for Virginia. The country had gotten behind the colony and turned a struggling, faction-ridden fort into the seed of English civilization in the new world. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website, AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to firsthand accounts and things. See you next week.